Well, thank you very much. It was really sweet. Thanks for the kind words. Um, yeah, I'm excited about Lynn's work. We also, uh, Jeff and I both got published in um, Black and White Magazine for their December issue as well. So, so far, so good on that journey um, of getting stuff out there. So um, I do run road runner photography tours, and basically what you're going to see tonight um, are some images from various trips that we've taken over the years. And um, as Sadie mentioned, don't don't hesitate. Like if you have a question, stick it in the chat. If you want to interrupt me, that's fine. Sometimes the questions will lose context if we wait till the end. So um, you know, feel free. It, it won't it won't throw me off track. Because I don't think now that I said it, I might have given myself a curse, but. Um, I think it'll be fine. So just feel free to like, uh, you know, jump in anytime. It's not a problem. So I'm going to share my screen and then we will get rolling. All right. So you guys should be seeing um, the front, the front the slide. Is that the case? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so as mentioned, we're going to talk about life at 66 North. So that's the 66th parallel. And um, basically that parallel is the dashed line right here about the Arctic Circle. And it kind of cuts through all of these places. Um, so you'll see Iceland down at the bottom, you know, Greenland, and then Alaska off to the side someplace way up here. So um, you'll, what I'm hoping you'll take away in some respects, particularly from the imagery, will be the similarities of these places. You can really see how at some point in time we were all connected and um, the land formed and looks very similar across the board um, in these locations and the experiences and how you put, you know, how you uh, go there, how you take imagery, how you conduct yourself in terms of like the right clothing and all that kind of stuff is all very similar. Um, and that's kind of why I felt like when I first built this that it gelled really well as a topic. So. Let's get off. We'll start with Alaska. Um, we were actually just there recently. Um, I love Alaska and I wish it was a little bit easier to get to. And we were supposed to go to Denali and or actually, well, we went to Denali, but we were supposed to have access. I won the lottery this year to go the whole 90 miles in private vehicle through Denali. And of course, 10 days before our trip, there was a landslide. So we could only get to mile 30, kind of a downer. But you'll see some imagery in this that takes you out the whole, the whole distance. So the largest state in the US, um, it's the northernmost and westernmost state, as we all realize, comprises um, more than uh, the total area of the three largest states combined. And I, I think that people don't really realize exactly how big Alaska is. Their population um, is actually down. Um, and then their most of the state is at the 60th parallel, um, even though parts of it cross up, up into the Arctic. Half the population of the state actually lives within Anchorage. So you're gonna see a similarity with um, Iceland where 90% plus of the population of Iceland live in and around Reykjavik. So, you know, generally one really big town and then a lot of dispersed community, little communities outside. Um, it's one of the smallest state economies and yet it has the highest income. And part of the reason I think that per capita income has to do with what these industries are, right? So their economy is dominated by fishing and gas and oil, but they also get a stipend for actually living there. So because it's treacherous most of the year. So let's look at this. This is just on the road. Um, so a lot of these images, you know, are just gonna be some big landscape images. Um, this is from the train. Now you can take the train from Anchorage all the way to Fairbanks. It's estimated to be 10 to 12 hours. Ours was 14 or 15 hour long day um, because there's all these things called whistle stops where somebody will like raise their hand. They'll be like on the side of the tracks with their snowmobile or their dog sled and they will flag the train down and every time that happens the train will come to a stop and people will um on board or off board as needed because that's the only way for them to get to town to buy provisions so it's a it's a very interesting system to watch um really fascinating actually because these people live out in the middle of nowhere and live off the land a lot of people do obviously um not everybody but these are just some of the massive scenes that you're going to see as you're going through that uh area uh, little Moose, she was hanging outside of um, Healy, Alaska when we were up there. 
Alaska is known for its eagles. There's great times and places to go. Uh, the Chilkat in the fall is one of those places. This happens to be, um, and I'll have other eagles that are actually taken more down by Homer, which is the southern end of the state. But um, the Chilkat is a national park area there that during the late fall and early winter, all of the water sources are starting to freeze. And there's this one area of convergence of rivers where the water doesn't freeze and all of the eagles go there. And, um, you know, you're talking hundreds of eagles fishing and fighting um, and flying about and hanging out in this one area late fall. This is called Independence Mine. So there's obviously a lot of mines in, this, in the state itself, but this is on the road from uh, Palmer, Alaska to Talkeetna. And it's a really cool, um, obviously it's a national park or a park, might be a state park. Um, but off to the side here that you don't see is the whole dilapidated mine. And uh, it's a really fascinating area to learn about. And then you can take this back road through these mountains that you see in this scene to end up on the other side, uh, heading towards Denali. Um, on the sides of the roads here, you lots of opportunity to see some mountain goat. Doll sheep, we haven't, I don't have pictures of doll sheep in here, but um, the mountain goat just crawling along the side of the highway um, on the way down through Turnigan Arm. If you look really closely in the left third of this frame, it looks like some specks in the water, but these specks are actually this moose and her calf um, cruising across this huge lake. It was really interesting because it's sort of like, what's that moving through the water? It had no expectation until they started to get out that they were swimming across um, what was actually a fairly substantial sized lake uh, to see this little calf cross with their mother. Um, a lot of beautiful wallflowers. Again, you might not think about that in this in this part of the world. Um, they have a very short spring window, but when it happens, which is actually late for us, right? It's usually like July-ish. Um, you'll get wallflowers all over the place, and very you know varying kinds. Things that we see in other parts of the country as well. But it's quite lovely. But the window for this is really really short. This is those were taken like out just in the middle of uh, the Kenai area by Seward. This was taken outside of Seward at a lake. And then you get to Denali, probably the most famed park in the area and certainly the most accessible. There are many parks within Alaska national parks, but a lot of them um, are fly in parks. Like you go up into the Brooks Range, there's three parks in that area. The only way to get to them is by float plane. Um, Denali is definitely the most accessible in general. So this is uh, the road into Denali. Now, only about 15% of the people who visit this park actually have the opportunity to see Mount uh, Denali, which is what you see here on the center uh, right, where the road is pointing. Um, most people who go actually never get fortunate enough to see it. Now, knock on wood, because we've been very fortunate to see it each time we've been to Denali, but um, it's not unusual if you don't give yourself enough days that you might, you might miss it. Um, some gri a grizzly, go ahead. Question? Okay. Um, this grizzly and her cubs a few years back, um, they're getting fat. Now, Denali is actually a park. You'll see other bears that I got from Alaska as well, but Denali is one park where um, the bears are a threat uh, to humans. And part of the reason for that is that, as you can see, like they're, what are they feeding on, right? They're feeding on berries and roots and grubs. Um, they do not have a huge source of protein, um, like other bears in Alaska that ha have uh, access to salmon. So it is, they're very strict about, um, you know, you getting close and people have been actually uh, mauled or killed in, um, in Denali from bear attacks. So it's one of those places that you can certainly go off and hike. There's a lot of backcountry camping here, but you have to be really mindful um, of the bear activity because they don't, they're hungry as they go into winter and you might look like a meat popsicle. So something to be mindful of. Uh, another just shot of Denali coming through the road. Now, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we actually did not get to go all the way in this last time because of a, um, uh, what's it called? I always forget the name. I want to say prismatic, but it's not. It starts with a P. Um, there's huge mountain pass that you kind of pass from the front end in the, to Denali into the back end. Polychrome, it's called polychrome. Um, and that is where they had the landslide and they have it every year the land moves constantly there 
but they have um, decided now that instead of clearing the road and continuing to fix it, they're actually just going to build a bridge that probably swings out around it. So hopefully by uh, next season, that will not be a factor anymore. The land can continue to slide past it. Um, as you can see, as you kind of get on the other side of Polychrome, the, the vista really opens up and it's really a, an amazing landscape. This is just a telephoto shot into Denali. Now, I just want to point out, like if you look at this one, I get to these shots of Iceland, you'll see that there's some really similar feeling landscapes, similar looking landscapes, but it's, it's really quite incredible in the summer there, um, just how green and how lush it actually is before the harsh winter comes. The ground squirrel is standing up, checking out his beautiful surroundings. Kenai uh, is another national park, and this is an area on the eastern side between um, sort of the mainland proper and where Juno would be on the other side, on the on the North American side, like on the Canada side. Um, and it's known for its fjords. So Kenai is where you would you take a, basically you'd want to take a boat ride and go in and out of the fjords, and you'll see some shots uh, from the water when we did that. Uh, but Seward is a really cute little town. Um, this is halibut catch. Everybody like hanging up their big catches for the day at the end of the day. When you get out on the boats, um, you're, you're just in and out of these fjords going up and down the coastline and there's just some, some tremendous wildlife and big landscapes to be seen. Um, you know, the, the boats here give you a real sense of scale to like exactly how big these, this area is and um, just how epic the landscape is. Some of my favorite uh, little guys here, otters, this is my see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil shot. Um, there are a lot of glaciers. Uh, they're getting smaller. So some of the most um, accessible, uh, this one I think is exit and um, hmm, starts with a P. Wow, brain cramp. I want to say portage, I think. Um, but both of those glaciers are getting smaller. So they're pretty accessible. You got to hike out to them. But at the end of the day, um, every time like we've gone, the glaciers are pulling further back. Now that's not the case of all the glaciers there, but um, it is sort of more on the inland glaciers that we've noticed that, but the glaciers are ginormous and you'll see tons of them when you're out on the water, the most notable being Northwest University Glacier. There's some glacier shots. A lot of calving. Um, so this is a basically a, a, a fall. You know, this is like a waterfall uh, coming of, of the, as opposed to like these big chunks that you'll see when we get to Greenland, where you get these huge calving of like city sized blocks of ice. Um, here you'll, you see tend to see waterfall basically calving. Some puffin, also well known to Green, uh, not Greenland, excuse me, Iceland. Seals just cruising. The huge glacier in the Kenai and some killer whales. So we, um, well, these are dolphins for all that know. They're not, they're called killer whales, but they're actually in the dolphin family. Um, but you will in certain times of year also get bubble, um, bubble feeding from the uh, gray whales. We have not seen that. I would love to see that. You just have to get there at the right time. And there are also a lot of beluga whales in um, Alaska in August time frame around Anchorage. So I just like the contrast here of this like spring honey day against this ice cold glacier. Another crazy mountain goat on the side of a mountain. This is actually shot from the boat as well. And I enjoy, personally, I like all kinds of photography. So really the only thing that I don't do are events. I'm not a big fan of um, wedding or that kind of photography. It's just not what drives my interest, but pretty much everything else is a, uh, is a free, you know, kind of I'm interested in it and I'll try it. And I do like abandoned stuff. Now this is an iPhone shot that I took. And when I, I didn't really pay much attention to it. I just was so impressed by the massiveness of this liner that, you know, I got right below it and I shot up with my iPhone. When I got home and I really looked at it, um, you'll see that there is a full-size fishing trawler in the bottom right corner. And 
but I always use this as a uh, photo to demonstrate scale, right? You wouldn't really know that I wasn't looking at a toy in a bathtub. Um, I could shoot a similar image with a toy in a bathtub. If it wasn't for the fact that there was a full-size boat that you can sort of rationalize in your head, um, but this, this um, ship is just, it was just incredible to stand below it. The shipyard is in Seward. So lands in uh, to the southern end of the state. Um, this is where uh, in Homer, Alaska, and it is the last sort of contiguous land before you, and then you get out into the Aleutian Islands. So uh, the, most of these are taken in and around Homer. So a lot of uh, boats, dilapidated boats, again, I love abandoned sort of dystopic uh, imagery. Lots of eagles in this part of the world. Um, Homer's known for its eagles. When we were there in June, we stopped at a place called Deep Creek. They were in the middle of the um, a big fishing cycle. And so the fishermen were basically gutting the fish and throwing the carcasses back out into the water. And we had, you know, two, three hundred eagles around us um, walking on the beach, you know, fighting over fish carcasses. So it's a really um, an interesting place to be at, in that time of the year uh, because there's the eagles are so prevalent. Now this looks like a toy, but it's actually a full-size uh, fishing, little fishing skiff. It's not a full-size fishing boat. But I was, when I look at it, I'm like, what's behind it? And I honestly can't remember what's behind it, but it's a ball of some sort. I think it might be part of another boat. Um, but this thing looks like a toy. It's kind of crazy. So these are just boats that are in a um, all around actually Homer that just out there. So the net, the last national park that we're going to look at uh, today for Alaska is Katmai. Now Katmai is on the western side of the Cooks Inlet um, and north, and so it is really not very accessible except for by um, float plane, but it is more accessible than the parks that are in the northern. Uh, on the north slope. So it, it's like hard, but not super hard. And you can, um, it's known for its bears, like bears and fishing. That's basically what it's known for. And we went there for the bear viewing, but you'll get a lot of fishermen. There's competition for the few spots to stay with fishermen who want to fish the river while the bears are out fishing the river as well. This first two shots are just a couple of the um, just a couple images to kind of demonstrate what you see. And I like, I personally like this one because it feels like I'm looking like at the whole of the earth, right? If you think about earth from space that you see um, from like the shuttle crews, it, to me, this is just a little microcosm of what that looks like from space. And it's such an a, amazing place. Like you can only imagine all of the cool stuff happening here if you could just land and um, poke around a while. So Katmai is known for the bear population, um, the coastal grizzly population uh, fishing. And you can see this guy with fish in his mouth and he's getting up onto this rock to have a meal. It's really interesting the way they eat them. They basically peel them um, and throw away like the bulk. They really look for the meat and the roe and then they get rid of the rest and then the eagles um, and smaller bears downriver get the, get the, get the leftovers. And I actually found the fish as interesting as the bears, to be honest. To see these salmon like throw themselves against um, this, it's not a high waterfall, it's about seven, eight feet, but to just throw themselves against it constantly until they can manage to get up is, it's really just remarkable to watch um, this, you know, kind of nature and this um, instinct at act in its action right just have their their will to do it is truly amazing and i got video of them i mean it was like the bears were around but i found the fish to be fascinating here's one these are little bears they're just goofing off and playing and the interesting thing about katmai is when you're there um it's not like your normal national park you get off on a, you get off the plane you go to get on to the beach and you walk up and you get a, you get trained on how to be in this area of the world, right? How to act around the bears and to be what to expect. And then you basically, once you leave this area of Brooks Lodge, um, and it's not lodge in the broad sense, they do have places to 
stayed, but it's not like a big hotel. Um, you've got basically got cabins, uh, public bathrooms, and a place to eat. You, once you leave this confined area, um, you're on paths that the bears use to get from A to B. So you, you have incredible access to nature here, um, as well as proximity to the bears. And once you cross the river and really get out into to the park on your way to the river, there, it, there, you know, there just are no rangers. You might pass a ranger on the path, but you are, you really are walking in their territory. And you have to be very mindful of that. Now they don't allow you to take any food. You can only take clear water, like a bottle of water with you, but nothing that has a scent. Um, and the difference, as I was starting to say, like about Denali and the bears wanting protein is that these bears are incredibly well fed and so you are not really on their agenda. And I have been extraordinarily close in a terrifying moment. Ter I'm terrified the bear couldn't have cared less, um, but you never know. And on these paths, when they're standing right next to you, you're like behind a twig of a tree. It feels like a twig. And um, they're not interested because they're not hungry. So the difference is, is cat mice never had a mauling or a death, even though the proximity to the bear is incredibly close. Um, there are fishermen, like in this scene here, he's fishing. This particular bear is about to launch and fish, but there's fishermen right behind him down river. They just leave people, everybody kind of leaves everybody else alone in this environment. And I think the biggest reason is that these guys are well fed as they go into their hibernation cycle. So I was desperately trying to get to Tom Mangle and shout of the bear and the, catching the fish and where the fish is, is where Tom's bear was. We had a one-year-old or two-year-old bear, not quite skilled in the fishing yet. And he was standing on a prominence behind. So he kept missing the fish. Like the fish never got to right where he was. It's kind of a bit of a downer on our day, but activity. This is what I'm talking about. The bears are just in the forest off the path. These next couple of shots um, are also coastal grizzlies. These are actually on Cook's Inlet. They're not really in the park, um, but they feed for clams. So that's his, he's all covered up in mud and he's out digging and uh, pulling clams up to eat. And this one is about, I'd say 50, 60 yards, 60, 50, 60 feet from us walking towards us. And so there were, there were five of us and a, and a pilot and um, we basically stood in a wall and the bear walked pretty close, like closer than you might think. Um, and then took a right, went around us, took a left, came back and got right back in the straight line. So as if we had not been there at all, this bear got right back on its path and kept walking. Uh, looks like he's looking at us meanly, but he again, walked right by us with no concern, but it, Get pretty remarkable to experience these guys up close like that. So the Iditarod, um, I don't know how much how much about Iditarod you guys know, but um, it's called the Last Great Race. It goes from Anchorage to Nome, Alaska, or Fairbanks to Nome, depending on how much snow has fallen in any given year. Um, it is really remarkable to watch um, the dogs absolutely show joy in their experience um, and they they just live to run and so it's it's really wild to like see them and be up close and personal with them as they're going about their business and we this is in Wasilla so out just outside of Wasilla we saw them come by it's like first couple of miles of the race and um, we had just a great location to get super close to the, the, the sled teams as they come through. One of the ladies, a lot of women run in this race, ride in this race. So it's, um, you know, it's not exclusively men, pretty well populated by a uh, few hardy women. Excuse me. And did, I thought I didn't. Have... Go ahead. Did those dogs have um, shoes on? Yeah. They do, they don't always, not all of the dogs do, but they do have little, these little booties. You can see them really well here. Um, you know, they have different colors. I don't think the colors mean anything. I think it was like what was on sale on that particular day. Um, but they put those on because the dogs are gonna run four days, um, two weeks. 
and uh, they do rest like every night. They camp down and they bed and they get in, they have bed inspections at every stopping point, and um, they are well taken care of. But to sort of save the pads of their feet um, for the the long distance, they wear little booties. It's adorable, actually. Thank like you. you can see, this guy's got red and pink, uh, orange. Yeah. Go ahead. I was wondering so. whether it was because of the cold. No, it's not so much the temperature. I think it's the fact that they're going to run day after day. And they start with up to 16 dogs and they have to finish, I think, with 12. There's a limit. Like you can only have so many dogs come out. And the dog is like, say some something happened or a dog got hurt or a dog was tired. They will actually um, take them off of the ropes that they're uh, they're attached to and put them in the um in the sled with them so every now and then you'll see a sled go by with a dog chilling um and getting getting a ride but uh yeah there's there's really strict rules governing um really the dogs not even so much the riders themselves but the dogs are really well monitored um and most of these guys will tell you that their dogs eat better than they do uh that they eat you know meat and you know like there's the diets are so strict and their health is so monitored that the dogs are uh well well better taken care of than the actual riders themselves that's good because it's quite uh, quite an effort physical effort for them absolutely oh absolutely but i'll tell you I've, I've actually been on a dog sled and um it's just amazing the whole experience of it's amazing but just the, the dogs when it's time to get on the lead run up I mean this is like they these breeds that they that they use um really live for live to run and if you fall off like if the rider falls off not me because like I wasn't the driver but if the driver falls off and lets go by accident the dogs will just keep going the dogs are perfectly content to go out and run uh -oh. a track and um they won't stop to find out if their driver is okay or oh huh. look our master fell that's not the case at all the dogs just keep going oh and is that you pretty funny is that you in the picture no 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 oh no 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 uh -uh. this is a this is a i can't even remember her name now i'd have to go back to this year and uh, look up her number her bib number but um there are a number of women who who participate within the race and um this is just one of the ladies that you know it takes years to train and they all have to um it's kind of like a marathon where you have to, you know, run races up to the marathon and qualify. Well, they have sledding um, trials that they have other races that they have to compete and place in, or they're not even allowed to do the Iditarod because it's so uh, long and arduous. So, Denise, uh, Denise, I was just uh, Googling the Iditarod. Is it true that in 141 days, 22 hours, 28 minutes, and five seconds, it's the 50th anniversary <laughs> of the Iditarod? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I would I would say that that's probably true, which means if you were interested in going to that, booking now would be That five, would be cool. So. <laughs> March 5th. Yeah. So I've, All right. I've been to two of them, and one of them had um, the start right outside of the Wasilla area, and they always have a... Um, ceremonial start in Anchorage and it's just basically a gigantic reason to party in downtown Anchorage the couple nights before the race starts and um, even if there's not enough snow they will truck snow in and like dump it in this <laughs> couple block area of Anchorage to like have the <laughs> ceremonial start and they run a bunch of reindeer through town and there's like bands playing I mean it's a very 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 big deal and then the race starts, and then you can actually visit the race across a number of uh, of the stopping points. So I've actually been to the Wasilla one, and it, to me, it, it's always been something I've been doing in addition to going like above the Arctic Circle to do uh, aurora photography. So it, I've never like followed the race, and I've all and I've also been at the start in Fairbanks um, and down river in Fairbanks, and that was, I mean, that one was freaking cold. I mean, it, it was like 20 degrees. I mean, just rid, frigid. So you have to really prepare for it. But um, if you were totally interested in looking into it, I know that you can actually get taken by um, plane 
to various stops further out towards Nome. So instead of the like hodgepodge of being in Fairbanks and Anchorage, you can get out to one of the quieter points that people pass through and really experience like the Arctic and the race in its truest form, right? Where you're in the middle of nowhere. Um, so if it was something people were interested in, I'd say explore a lot of the options because there's a lot to it. Like if you were trying to go to the 50th in Anchorage, you know, you're going to probably find that booking even now would be difficult. You might try Airbnb. Um, it will pass through Fairbanks, even if it starts in Anchorage. It goes to Fairbanks when there's not enough snow lower in the state, but will always pass through. So you can go up to Fairbanks and see it regardless of where it starts. And then, like I said, you can go out into the um, wilderness and see them come by as well. So, and I think seeing it from like a plane, one of the little bush planes would be really interesting, but they will also land you and you can see it from out there as well. So, um, so above the Arctic Circle. So again, we are, we are at 66 North. A lot of this is all happening between 60 and 70, 60 and 68 um, parallel. Uh, Arctic Circle 66 and above. Now um, you fly in, obviously uh, you can take the ice road. I've never driven the whole ice road. I've been on it, but I haven't driven the whole thing. Um, but it's much easier to fly in, takes a whole lot less time. So this is just flying over some of the, um, you know, mountainous range that exists between where Anchorage and where we stay, excuse me, Fairbanks and where we stay. And we stay at a little lodge uh, in Bettles. There are, it's a town of about 15 people, um, and half of them live on one side of the town, which is the sort of European humans, and then you have the other half of the population lives on the native, the native um, Inuit side of town, and they only come together at the radio at the weather station. Like there's a weather station, and they kind of work together there. But for the most part, the two populations stay separate. So this little village is a trip to visit. Um, this is me taking the photo, so I'm not driving it, but I'm in the bucket um, on my dog sledding. And you'll see some of them have booties, some don't. It really has mostly to do with the dogs um, and how they react, uh, what they've learned about them and how they react to their running. Um, but it's really amazing and just the sort of whoosh of the sled on the snow. Um, if you've never imagined a dog running and pooping at the same time, they do that extraordinarily well. It's just a trip. Um, but the whole thing, you know, when you're out in the middle of these, uh, these are called black uh, spruce. It's, this is these trees are hundreds of years old, and they're you can see they're only 20, 25 feet tall tops, um, because of the season is so short that they grow very slowly. So it's it's really amazing to witness. Some flight seeing that we do out there. Um, so this is the Brooks Range, uh, these huge granite mountains out uh, out there. I have landed um, in to um, the Gates of the Arctic, which is another park, but uh, not really explored. We basically dug a hole, put some chairs in, and had a you know hot cocoa and hung out for a while uh, to get our like time in the park. Now auroras, um, we started the conversation with auroras. These are some auroras out of Alaska. Um, this is now they come in all kinds of different displays. So you saw you see the picture behind me. Um, that is a it's a real distant display because I am in Montana and generally we don't get access. But this is um, this is sort of shooting straight up into the sky and the it's a coronal display. So this display is coming straight down. At, uh, at us, it's breathtaking when it happens. Um, it has to be, you know, you do, you kind of have to be in the right part of the world to see it. Otherwise you're seeing it at a, at a sort of a, you know, at a distance like the one behind me. But this is, is pretty epic to see and witness. This is taken outside of um, Fairbanks in an area called Charlie Dome out in Chena Hot Springs. Um, you'll see that it's a pretty long exposure. The, we had cloud cover, which is a bit of a downer, but um, you'll see the star trail starting to take place. So this is, is this camera shutter was open for a while. This is uh, taken in Bettles out by the lake and um, the whole sky lights up. It's really tremendous. Um, you'll see the Pleiades like in this sort of 
bottom right corner. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a, I don't know if you can see my mouth, but the Pleiades is right here. It's always kind of fun to try to capture um, constellations that make sense to people, and kind of rationalize what you're looking at. But for people who don't know, now I have a whole free um, guide, um, um, ebook on auroras, what they are and how to shoot them on the website. And I'll have a link to the website at the end. I mean, so you guys can see what it is, but it's roadrunnerphotographytours.com, how to, and then there's a book on auroras, there's a book on long exposure, and there's a bunch of stuff if you want to go out there and check it out. But essentially what this is, is the sun um, has all these gases and gases pull away and, you know, float out into the, uh, into the universe often in our direction. And when they're really big, they're called a coronal mass ejection. And as, as we were talking about earlier, I guess one, one lamp launched off just a, uh, about a week ago. That's the picture that of it coming in uh, behind me. That's, I guess one just launched and there's an expectation that either over the weekend or early next week, it'll come. And basically what happens is, is that gaseous matter um, comes into our magnetic field and it, the magnetic field sends it out and around and it stretches and then slings back into place and dumps the cloud of, of um, dust basically at the poles. Well, depending on how strong that whole interaction is, you get different kinds of displays. So here you'll see that I've got yellows and, and um, reds and greens in the one behind me, there's greens and blues. So the color depends on what electrons are being excited by the, the particles of the dust. And so depending on how far this pushes into our atmosphere, you get different colors, the most common being green. But um, you can see depend, you can see that this is like a really kind of a tall display. You can just tell by the way it looks. It's hitting different levels of the atmosphere, exciting different gases, creating different light uh, when those electrons are bouncing around. So, um, just another example, and actually it's not really cut off this way. I think there's more of it, but anyway, similar uh, scene. So they come in different, just different patterns, and it has to do with, with the air, you know, the movement in the atmosphere, which direction that the uh, winds are going. All kinds of things go into the sort of kind of display that you see, um, but you get ribbons, you get banding, you get these huge wide displays. It, it's really quite epic. And all the light on the ground that you see in this foreground is being illuminated by this aurora. That's exactly how bright that it got. Um, so it's pretty remarkable. And I'll show you a little bit of this movie, or did I end up deleting the movie? There we go. Yeah, here, there we go. So I think that's that one. Here's another little sequence. Sorry, <laughs> just, I, mean, I want to watch your time, so I'm not going to let it run now. I actually have a two-minute video, too, of the one that created the image behind me that I can show you all at the end if we have time. Um, all right, so that was Alaska, um, kind of from north to south, east. The only place I've really not been, I mean, there's a lot of places in Alaska I haven't been, I have to be honest. But in terms of big, notable locations, I haven't been over on the Juno side, and that's mostly because... You got to fly in or, or boat in. It's it's a and once you're there, you can't really get anywhere else without flying or boating back out. So it's not how you get there. It's that it's like really landlocked once you're there. And generally, I'm in Alaska because I'm on my way to Denali or I'm on my way to Katmai or I'm on my way to Bettles. And so I see a lot of my Alaska as part of other trips. And so I tend to be on what I would consider sort of the mainland. So now we're going to talk about Iceland. Um, you can see it. It's really funny because people think about Iceland as being the kind of thing, oh, I'm going to see Iceland and, you know, I'm going to be there for four days and drive around Ring Road. And the reality about Iceland is it is literally a country, people. And it's a gigantic country 
much bigger than the map implies. And um, so I'll show you a picture of what the Ring Road looks like. But um, if you were really trying to conquer Iceland in just a few days, um, you would never be able to stop at anything to take a picture. So you need a little bit more time than you think. I have literally been in every part of Iceland except for the fjord um, that is like this little ducky looking one on the right hand corner. I, I've literally driven the rest of it. Um, it's a stunningly amazing place. And if you've never been, I would definitely put it on the I'm a photographer need to see list. So it's the world's ninth largest um, island country. It sits at a confluence of the Arctic and the North Atlantic. And it's just outside of the Arctic Circle. So it sits between 63 and uh, 68 degrees. It was settled by Vikings. Um, that's where all the sagas come from. And sagas are extremely, their sagas and their history and their, and their folklore is hugely prominent even today. Um, it became independent from Denmark in 1944. Its population um, is 366,000 um, with, like I said earlier, 99% of them live in an urban area with 75% right there in Reykjavik. Um, there's another couple of towns. Uh, Akuri is the other big town. And then a couple of medium or, well, small but notable towns like Hof and um, where there's some density like Vic. But outside of that, the rest of it, the population is really sparsely populated. And 91% of all the residents there are actually Icelandic. Uh, not a lot of immigration to the, to the country. Their geology is, is highly volcanic and a um, lot of seismic activity, very active. It's like the whole place is like our Yellowstone in terms of geothermal energy. 85% um, of all of their energy uh, comes from geothermal or hydropower. A lot of water in Iceland, lots of waterfalls and they've really tapped into that resource and they do expect to be energy independent um, by 2050. Uh, their natural springs provide all of their drinking water. It's like the best tap water in the world. And then all of their hot water comes from um, thermal springs. So it's, it's really remarkable um, just the way, there's a documentary on it too. I think if you go out to I don't know, I want to say it might be prime, but if you actually um, look for it, there's a lot of documentary on how they are using their natural resources and obviously noted for very long winters and short summers. So this is um, a picture of the Ring Road. It is, um, it says here there's like 13,000 um, kilometers of administered roads. There's 40, only, but only 4,600 of those are actually paved. And this whole area over where number six is, most of that is still dirt. It got, it was paved at one point and it got wiped out by a landslide coming off the, of the land here and they didn't repave it. So you would, again, when you think about, I'm gonna drive this road, doesn't seem big, but the average speed limit is 55. And um, there are cameras to monitor speed and you will get a ticket from your car rental agency if you get one. And I mean, you'll, they'll send it to you to pay, but then there's um, the the dirt roads might bring you down to 20 miles an hour, right? So you don't really get around it as easily as one might think. Um, and then there are a few roads that pass from seven to three, um, uh, but they're only accessible in the summer. Just make sorry, I was making sure there's anything I needed to address in the um, chat, which I now have got on my other screen. So um, there's lots of ways to see Iceland. This is how we see Iceland. What we take tours, um, we rent Land Rovers, um, and that gives us access to everything that we want to do. And um, we find it the nicest way, but you can use public transportation. They do have buses that will take you out of Reykjavik and around. But to really understand Iceland and see Iceland and enjoy Iceland, you have to leave Reykjavik to do it. So Reykjavik's kind of a cool town. It's usually our rally point to start. And then we go from there and um, explore the rest of the country. So ice caves, um, if you go in any time between November and March, you can go on caving tours, which we enjoy. Um, it's really quite, um, 
uh, remarkable to be inside the caves. And this actually goes to a question that uh, I don't know exactly when you asked it, Diane, but um, the short answer is yes, like it, particularly in Iceland, because I was going to Iceland every, oh, well, multiple times a year and then consecutive years. It was really um, interesting to see the changes in the, particularly for ice caving. So one year we went and the car, you know, we drove up, crossed the glacier and then like got to a spot to park and we maybe had to walk, I don't know, 15 minutes to get onto the ice and then trek across the ice to get to the cave. A year or so later, I think it was the following winter, we went back, parked in the exact same spot and hiked for over an hour to get to the glacier to get onto the ice, to get to the cave. So the short answer is yes. And Iceland will tell you very much so that they're, the changes in these uh, glaciers are from climate change, right? And um, they feel quite strongly about it. They know that this is a source of water for them. They know it's a source of income. Um, they take a lot of pride in their natural resources. And so they'll tell you that they're experiencing pretty radical change like landslides and things that don't happen normally because the ground is softer and thawing more. So um, I guess the short answer is yes. And I don't know about loss of species um, and habitat part of that, but I definitely know that um, there's a real notable change. Now, Greenland, will tell you, if so the guys that we went with Greenland, you'll see in a few minutes, um, they'll tell you that their uh, glaciers are not changing substantially, that theirs, theirs are fairly stable, even though they had that huge one that uh, broke off in the, Ar uh, in the Arctic. By and large, Greenland has found uh, stability still in their, in their uh, in their glaciers and the movement of their glaciers. So you don't see as much change there. So it really just depends on where you are in that whole area of the Arctic uh, to where change is really happening. And in Alaska, there's one of them that, uh, there's one in particular, I think it's, I don't know if it's Portage Glacier, if it's Exit Glacier, one of them has marked the place of like where the, where the glacier was on a given date, like a given year. And it goes all the way down the road. And when we, you know, we drove another 10 minutes before we even got to the glacier, like when we were there, right? So you'd see like, this is the 1935 and this is 1945 and this is 1955. And that sign just keeps moving up. And that's, and that's long ago, right? That is in about sort of the era, the time in the world we're in today. That That's over time that glacier has receded um, by miles. And it's, it's pretty remarkable that they had the foresight to track that. So I think that you see change and, and some of these changes just happen, right? They're just natural changes as opposed to accelerated change. So, um, anyway, this just gives you an idea of what it's like to stand inside the glacier. Um, it's, it really is quite tremendous and almost, um, it's breathtaking in its beauty, but it's also breathtaking in its, um, the magnitude that you are standing, you know, a mile underneath a pile of ice. It's, it's really tremendous. Um, but you can go ice caving, um, but it has to, like I said, November to March. Um, and this is our guy, Sven, really cool guy. Um, this is one of the things he does. So winter, he does ice caving. Summer, he does kayaking. Um, they're all outdoorsy, crazy guys. So, uh, so uh, Jokusalan, uh, Jokul is glacier. Um, so this is the glacial lagoon. And so this is not the glacier necessarily I was standing under, it might be a tongue of that glacier, but um, you've got the glacier way out in the background. And then you've got these gigantic bergs that are in the water. There are seals and birds that hang out here. And then those bergs, as they cut loose, they funnel through a river, which you'll see in just a second. And then they go out onto the Atlantic and then they kick back up as what's now called Diamond Beach by people um, as, you know, these big chunks of ice on the beach. So you'll see a little bit of all of that as I go through. But these pieces of ice that you see floating in front of you are thousands of years old. So they, they break off and then they float here and they can float here for days, weeks, months, years. It just depends on um, you know, the weather conditions and the tides. So you get all kinds of cool shapes and beautiful colors. Now, the one thing I will say about Iceland is it is the, in the winter, it is like the sunset that keeps giving 
Um, they last for hours and you can get really beautiful. You get some <laughs> rubber skies, but for the most part, the skies in Iceland are truly epic. So this is, so if you see, if you look in the back um, left-hand side, way in the background, you'll see a bridge back there, uh, sort of in this area, if you see my mouth to the left of this iceberg. So I'm actually on a boat, they take you out and you can float around. But this little, this berg is sort of out in front of the glacier and it's making its way to that bridge and will eventually at some point in its life cycle, hit the Atlantic. Um, this is over by the uh, bridge. Actually, this is closer to the front end. The glacier is way off to the right. But again, another just epic, epic sky. This is the confluence of where that lagoon is starting to turn into flowing river as it's going underneath the um, bridge. This is a gigantic size of a good SUV um, chunk of ice. And we were out there late at night uh, light painting it. That's why it's lit like that. It's being lit um, from behind, but with an LED light. And this is just a spattering of this ice as it gets uh, roughed up in the ocean and thrown back on the beach. This does not happen all the time. Um, I've been there. I've been lucky and seen ice on the beach many, many times, but it took a friend of mine seven different trips to Iceland to see ice on the beach uh, for his first experience. If you look up here in the sky, you'll see that this, there are little flakes and those are stars. So this was taken in late in the middle of the night and that light source on the left is actually a, is the moon. The moon, excuse me, like we have many of them, but the moon. Um, so this is what I'm talking about. The icebergs come out and they get rolled around on the beach and, and redeposited. Um, for our beauty, that's how I would look at that. So this is some just some shots from the south and the east coast. So this is Vesterhorn, um, you, lots of different views of that um, every year. People, I see, I see photos of this. It's a beautiful, huge, wide mountain range. This happened to be on a reasonably stormy day. Um, Iceland is known for its churches. It's not particularly religious, but there are little churches all over the place. And some people actually have their own. This particular one is also a cemetery. Um, just more like beautiful river and skies. A lot of abandoned farmland. Um, you'll see some horses here. So it's not exactly abandoned, but this particular farmhouse uh, is abandoned. It's known also for its green moss. This is called mossy, and they uh, actually make whiskey out of it. Um, water everywhere. It's truly remarkable. Um, it is truly remarkable how much water is in this country, and just it's unreal the amount of water you see flowing. Um, yeah, Lynn, I'll come back to your question. Um, and then this is an old DC-3 that uh, crashed on the beach. Um, I think they survived it uh, and it's been left abandoned. It used to be much easier. You could drive all the way out to it. Now you got to hike out to it, um, but it is still there. Part of the reason that changed is after Justin Bieber filmed a video and was crawling all over this thing, uh, the owner got tired of people getting off the track of his land and tearing up his up his volcanic land. Um, so he just closed it and said, you could park here and walk it, but I don't want people driving because they weren't sort of following the, the road that exists. And all of this black um, surrounding area here is, it's volcanic soil. So like a footprint will stay there forever until something else hits it. It's, it's, it's kind of one of those things and they're very conscious. They want you on their roads or on marked trail off-road area, but they don't want you creating new paths because it will scar their landscape um, really quite likely in their lifetime uh, for each individual in their entire lifetime. So it's very important to them that you stay, uh, you know, follow their rules and stay on the road way. Also a picture of Vesterhorn, this little white building in the middle, um, you'll see there's like, if you can see really closely, there's a fence around it. This was actually a, a scene for a Viking, um, like a lots of Viking things have been filmed here, but it's a movie set, which is kind of a trip. Um, this is just a sandstorm. So we, it, we've seen so much weather in Iceland, but we saw this like brown in the sky and we're like, what the heck is that? So we stopped and we shot it. We actually did drive through it. I've got a quick video um, of us driving through it. 
but I actually had to Google it because it never occurred to me where sand coming from, right? We're not in a sandy area, but um, in fact, they do get sandstorms because of all this like dry volcanic ground that will dust up. So it was pretty wild. With, uh, I've only seen it once. And, no, not that it happened once, but I've only seen it once. This is Skoga Foss. It's a well-known um, waterfall that just, again, look at the mass of water coming down and you can stand at the edge of that water other than getting covered in spray. Um, you know, there's no danger in being there, but it's really remarkable. Some abandoned ships, abandoned farms, more epic light because it is really remarkable there in the winter. Um, this is taken at night. You can see that there's some green and purple and green in the sky, and that's Aurora. At the time that I took this, we actually took the photo to look for Aurora, didn't see it on the camera LED, left and went back to town and probably missed an epic night of Aurora's, which is a downer. Um, but the light source here again is the moon. More moss, plain. This is kind of right outside of that uh, movie set. This is that same waterfall. So you get kind of a bigger sense of how, you know, just exactly how wide and how big it is. It's truly remarkable. Um, Highlands and North, now my favorite part of, Ice, of Iceland is the North. Um, most tourists go to the South, a part of why I like the North, but also it's just epically beautiful. Lots of um, cool stuff up there. This is us doing a river crossing. Um, one of the reasons we get our cars the way we do. Another church, I'm fascinated. You can see the God rays coming up, just the way the light was reflecting. Uh, I don't think the light was down at this point, but the God rays were really interesting. Known for its sheep, these guys are free roaming. They are everywhere. If you hit one with your car, you have to buy it from the farmer. You pay them for it because these are a source of income, um, but they are not fenced in. Very few trees in Iceland. Um, they say it was deforested by the Vikings to build their ships. I don't know if that's old wives tale or if that's accurate or a combination of various things, but you do not see um, a lot of trees. They have gone to some effort to replant trees. This is called Brufoss. I have another photo coming up. The water is extraordinarily blue. Um, it's really a very neat location. These are all Brufoss. A lot harder to get to this today than it used to be. Um, now you have to hike a mile or so to out to it. Used to be able to just kind of take a quarter mile trip through a neighborhood, uh, the backside of a neighborhood to get to it, but not anymore. This is called Betty Foss. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Prometheus, uh, the uh, in the very first scenes of Prometheus, one of the beings uh, fall from a waterfall. This is he's standing basically on this rock to my in the bottom right hand corner. So this is where that scene was shot. If you can access uh, this waterfall from the side I'm on and as well from the other side. If you look over here, there's like a little itty bitty couple of people up in this top uh, right hand side. So you get a sense of scale with how just how big and vast this is for the size of those humans. This is um, go to Foss, meaning God Falls, also in the north. And there's a little human here. You know, I used to work very hard to get people out of my photos. I would just wait you out or take a long exposure. So uh, you would blur. And I've actually learned over time to have a, an appreciation for the human in the scene because it does, again, give you a sense of scale. And otherwise, you don't have any idea how big this is, right? This is a not go to Foss, looks like it, but it's just a different waterfall we hiked out to. Uh, this is Kirkifo. Um, it's known. Um, if you know Tony Sweet, he'd call it the witch's hat, and it's a good name for it. It, sound, it looks like a witch's hat. It's on the north, uh, the north side of the peninsula, Schnefelnes Peninsula. This is in the center of um, Iceland, so a lot harder to get to, but a lot of volcanic activity. All the steam is coming from heat vents. And again, I would say, you know, the people give you a sense of scale. There's some people standing here, and there's actually a person sitting right here. Um, 
super small. And I didn't even know the person on the right was there until I started to process this. And I'm like, what's that blue speck in my photo? And when I zoomed out, it's a person sitting there with their arms on their knees. Um, but again, a, a real sense of just exactly how big this whole area is. And this reminds me, this area reminds me of a Bev Doolittle painting um, of the Palominos and the, the how they disappear into the sea and the browns and the whites and um, yeah, just one of my favorite parts of Iceland is this, this area right here. Other churches, more mountains, Icelandic horses. They don't want to be called ponies. These are full-fledged horses, and they are by far the supermodel of the horse world. Um, they're known for their sixth gate, so they actually have a, a one extra gate in their arsenal, and when they are in this gate, they basically hover um, and the rider doesn't move. It's really tremendous to watch them ride. Um, they just kind of glide across the ground uh, in the way that this gate functions. You don't get that kind of loppy uh, motion. They're also goofballs by far. Right, is this, all right. This is a kind of long, so I'm not going to bore you with it. This is flying in, that's our group. Some river crossing. It's sort of driving on the ring road. This is their version of Old Faithful, from Geyser. Oops, went further than I wanted to go. Sorry, hang on. Let's see, a lot of um, little buildings like this. These used to be homes. Now they're mostly storage places, but uh, built right into the landscape, right? Just to uh, buffer against the weather, really. Some more of the Glacier Lagoon. This is that sandstorm I was mentioning. A lot of one way tunnels. So even though it looks like there's a line here, these are turnouts. Um, there's it's literally one one uh, one roadway, and you have to share it going in two directions. So it's kind of a trip. Um, they have a four mile one and a seven mile one. Waterfall in a cave. Out in the highlands. The river crossings are like definitely the most fun. All right, so we're on to Greenland and um, I kind of feel like that's traveling to the top of the world. It is not the easiest place to get to. So uh, that's what it looks like. We basically hung out down in this area in the bottom right hand side of the peninsula um, in Scoresby Sound. There's only really one true village there. It's called Inter de um, Most of Greenland's life happens over on the uh, western side of the southern tip um, with very little happening up in the north. So Intertecormit is the largest village on the east coast. It was founded in 1925. It is still a Danish territory and the population when when I first put this together was 450 people and now it is 345. Uh, it is a population that is continuing to decline um, it's there isn't a lot going on there. So their whole economy uh, goes uh, is supported by whaling and polar bear hunting um, and then tourism. And um, the polar bear hunting is restricted, but uh, the families are allowed to hunt them as a source of food um, and pelts uh, to keep warm. And the average temperature is 18 degrees. Uh, although we were there, it was like t-shirt weather. So those have, uh, you know, but all bad. 
Um, so this is basically the route that we took. We did this. We basically were on a, a schooner, which you'll see pictures of in just a second. And this is the path that we took from Constable Point, which is uh, you'll see a picture of that airport in a second. Um, it's that's the airport. You basically come out of this little bay and then you head across Scoresby Sound and we normally you would go uh, to the Bear Islands first. We actually went to Hecla Havan and then around uh, just had to do with the weather. Um, but and then we hit Inner Tecormet last, um, although sometimes it's also the first stop. This is the plane that we took out to Greenland and this is the Greenland airport. So uh, two restrooms, one of them is on your left and the other one looks just like it only further inside. Um, so it's you know, very remote, not your typical airport. And if you get stuck in Greenland, you could, uh, the people that were getting off the boat and were flying back on the plane, we came in there, had already been there for four days living in the airport um, because they got held in by weather. That is our boat, a uh, two-masted schooner. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, it is a hybrid, so it has a diesel engine, but it also has 16 batteries and it runs on battery power uh, most of the time. And so for you on the boat, when we're on the boat, it's essentially silent. Even without the sails up, we're underway, but you can't hear it. Um, and the only time they run the diesel uh, is like when we're off during the day on a hike or out on the Zodiacs uh, in and around the bergs, then they'll run the diesel when nobody's there to be bothered by it. And then um, when we come back on, it's all quiet again. It's, it's a really remarkable vessel. Um, this is a, a, a picture of a gun, um, the boat in the background and the Zodiac, but it really does sum up the entire experience. So the gun is here because um, they give uh, like they would give us as as people who are like leading the tour on their boat, we get a gun, they have a gun, and then whenever you're on land, you have to carry the gun because uh, you might. It's not about polar bears, by the way. It is about musk ox. They don't like humans, and they will attack. They can attack. We never had that experience, but you have to have the gun like a just in case. Um, and then the Zodiac, because you spend a bunch of time on the Zodiac to and from the boat and in and around the uh, icebergs and then the, our boats in the background. So basically, this is the view you have when you leave the airport to go out to your um, uh, out to the boat. This everybody kind of they take uh, rounds of people out with all their gear and get you on and they come back and pick up the next group. When you go to Greenland, um, basically your trip starts in Iceland. So you fly into Reykjavik and you then go to the domestic airport, which is where this plane is. So this isn't the international airport in Keflavik. This is the domestic airport in uh, Reykjavik. And then you fly out uh, to Greenland from here. Now, uh, the place the North Sailing, which is who we go with, has two schooners, um, the Donnelly, and the Opal, we were on the Opal. The Opal flies under the Icelandic flag. The Donnelly flies under the Denmark flag. And really the flag has to do with the pilot. So your captain, if your captain is from Denmark, you'll have a, Den a Danish flag. If your captain is Icelandic, you'll have an Iceland flag. Ours, uh, our captain uh, obviously was Icelandic, so we sailed under the Iceland flag. This is what the berths look like. Um, they're tight but they're doable, you sleep well, um, and then there's shared bathroom facility. Just pictures of the boat. I found the boat fascinating. It was extraordinarily beautiful. This is Captain Aki. Um, I have no idea if he's still sailing, but I would assume he's still sailing it. This is Huskador. He was the first mate, an absolutely cutie pie. This is, oh my God, I literally just spaced her name. Catherine, <laughs> I was like lost it thinking about Husky. This is Catherine. Um, she was the first crew, or the only crew, really. It's a three-man crew, so the captain, the first mate, and the crew. And Catherine was the crew. And then this is Chef Leo. Um, he's not on the boat anymore. He uh, basically wanted to do it for one season. He is uh, in the Guinness Book of World Records for making sushi. He's a legit chef. We had the best food ever. Um, neat guy. So here's some of the views that you're going to see. This is a ice, from our very first iceberg we saw coming into the sound. Um, really beautiful with this hole in it. And we were coming into the sound late. So we had this beautiful purple sky. Um, 
just remarkable. Now, our boat, uh, the living quarters are downstairs, as is the dining area. So we have this, this is like a storage place, but all of our gear was, as you can see, piled here. And the boat holds um, 12. So um, basically, it's like nine, 10 guests, and then two guides, and then the crew have their own quarters. Uh, so this is all of the camera gear for all the people that were there. We did get to see polar bear um, the year that we went. These were the first and at the time, the only polar bear that they had seen. Um, so this is actually Jeff's photo. He just the a little polar bear foot up on the rock, made him very happy. Um, this is mine. It's not the best. The boat was moving, but um, trying to get him. He had the polar bear had just killed a seal. So this is a seal. And they think it was a mom and a cub of bear. Uh, there's a second bear, and they were swimming back and forth to feed um, on the seal they were sharing. So here's another one. And this one I like because it's, it's really environmental. He was This was when um, the second bear was leaving the kill and walking off and giving space to the other bear. Uh, just some of our guests like shooting, um, just remarkable landscapes, remarkable scenery. So they're shooting, and I'll show you a picture of what they're, what it looks like, but these are basalt columns. Um, there's all kinds of basalt in Greenland and Iceland, um, but they're hexagonal, you know, towers of rock. And so this is basically what they were shooting at. And it's just a trip. The colors are a trip. The landscape is a trip. Um, some bergs with big ice, with big landscapes of Greenland in the background. And the icebergs themselves are truly amazing, size and mass. They also have this feeling almost like they're made of a plexiglass. They're shiny um, and you just, they don't even feel like they would be cold. They feel like they would just be like hard plastic. It's, it's really um, amazing to sort of look at and experience. Um, this is just down low, hanging out of the Zodiac. So you spend a lot of time in and around these beautiful icebergs and landscapes. This is a huge pano. This is 20, 30 shots or whatever going across just to try to get the volume of the pano uh, and its reflection because the water was so still. So the water's a little bit choppy. Um, uh, when you're crossing the sound, but once you get into the rest of that path that I showed you, that yellow path, the water is pretty calm. Um, and the only thing really causing a disturbance in the water would be the boat itself. So you get some really beautiful reflections. And um, yeah, so there's a comment here about the icebergs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, coming in in Newfoundland, coming out of uh, out of Greenland. And yes, I would totally believe that. Yeah. Newfoundland's beautiful. I spent a week there, but only had a little bit of time to get around. So it's on my things to do list. <clears throat> and you can see here, right, the landscape yet again is similar. So we've seen the same exact kind of landscape in Iceland and in Alaska. And I, I do believe that has a lot to do with it being all at the same point in the on the planet. And just to look back at the boat. Um, there's a person here, again, just to give scale, um, you know, this is one of our hikes that we were able to go off and do. Um, so you leave the boat, you come here, you park, and then you kind of get a different feel for it. Another hike, um, almost lunar to me, this view, right? Other, other than the fact there's water, it just has this amazing lunar feel. Also, springtime there. Now, this is August, and this is their, their spring, right? So, so far north. Um, still in the middle of what we would have ha would have happened in the lower 48 in April. Uh, some of the the group I'm on a zodiac taking this photo. Some of our people up there hiking, and they actually ended up finding a musk ox. The guys up in the top left had found a, a musk, musk ox carcass, so they are hunted for food there. You can see that sort of plasticky feel here on the left. I mean, it's just a trip. And these bergs are the size of a New York City block. I mean, it, they're ginormous. It, it's really hard to explain. And you'll see some aerial shots to try to get some perspective in a minute. Now this uh, deep blue vein, 
So what happens is as ice compresses, the more pressure that's put on it, it, get, it goes to this blue ice. And so um, it's really remarkable to see it within this otherwise white ice. Um, but it was really fun. So you'll see another band of it here on the right, as well as a waterfall from just uh, the snow melt. Um, so it was fun to find the patterns in this hard blue ice, another waterfall. This bird is like two, three, four city blocks big. I mean, this is a hundred feet high. It's, it's, it's truly hard to fathom exactly how big they are. They come in all shapes and sizes. They're very cool as they start to roll and turn and change shape and get holes in them. Um, man, it would have been just awesome to walk around that beach. You know, there's no way. They're never going to let you because it's very dangerous. It could turn on any moment. But um, here's a shell. These are, you can see there's like four gigantic shelf bergs here. We are nowhere near this thing. I'm zoomed out into it and you can just see the enormity of it. And there's like whole big walls of this stuff break off of these uh, glaciers. And then you get little ones. This is like the size of the boat. So here's a, a taken from a drone shot. So my drone, um, you'll you can sort of see into the water here, and they say that 90% of the iceberg is under the water. So it's kind of what happened to the Titanic. They didn't have a good appreciation for exactly how big that iceberg was, um, and they didn't turn enough to get away from it, basically. But you kind of get that perspective that this thing grows, but it goes down tremendously under the water. Now. Another drone shot, but just for scale, uh, top right here, uh, just off that sort of iceberg piece coming out, is a zodiac with people on it. And it's almost imperceivable how uh, small they are in comparison to this block of ice that they're traveling around. Another example, and you can see so much of this bird going down into the depths of the water here. So these are some uh, gigantic bergs, and you'll see in the very back corner, or back middle, excuse me, um, are the two boats. So they put, when they run their tours, they do put both boats in the water at the same time, but there are very few places where we come together ever, and this has happened to be one of them. So they're out there in case of emergency, but they also don't stay in the purview, so not every photo you get will have another boat or anything in it. Um, but they like to have two boats out just in case there's a problem. Um, it helps with any kind of rescue. Again, more beautiful skies and lights in this part of the world. This angled light is wonderful. Now, on one of our hikes, we found a big berg that had an opening in it, and we asked the captain if he could find it, and he did. He sailed around this whole sort of island and went into this bay where this was and then set up for us take photos. So some of us are on the boat taking photos of the Zodiac and some of us are on the Zodiac taking pictures of the boat. Um, another perspective shot, I mean, here's the Zodiac at front of the wall of the glacier. And uh, also in front of the glacier, but pulled up uh, against uh, one of these really compressed dark pieces of ice that's calved off. And you can see that we're dressed like in these suits. These are um, basically life suits. So if you were to fall in this water otherwise, um, you'd probably have just seconds to last. Um, these suits will buy you some time to get fished out of the water without going hypothermic. Um, so when you're out in and around bergs, you would put these suits on and everybody's assigned a suit. You have the same suit, you keep it in your room. Um, they let us climb the mast. And I did not, the crow's nest is right above me. Um, there was one particular move I was going to have to make, and I know my limits. And so I got to the cross mass, but I was like, yeah, I just don't need that other four feet. Some people went all the way up, but that's the view looking down. So it's pretty tremendous. I'm totally roped in with a harness. I mean, I'm completely safe here. It's just my comfort level wasn't to expose myself to get up any higher them in focus. So our boat took uh, some building uh, building supplies out to a research uh, camp on an Inuit in an Inuit village. And uh, so these are just some of the kids, you know, playing with a, either a telescope or a spotting scope. Um, but when we were out there, 
they said as a thank you, they wanted to go hunt an us, a musk ox with us, with, not with all of us, but with our chef. So Chef Leo here, uh, he and Husky went out with uh, two hunters from the village and they shot an, a musk ox and Leo broke it down in the field and brought back all the meat for our boat, the sister boat and the village. Um, so the, well, the meat got split amongst everybody. And this is some of the, um, some of the meat you can see Jeff was having none of it. So these guys are both named Jeff, but this one, uh, the little guy with the Swiss cap on is mine. And uh, he was just disgusted by the whole thing. Um, but here's some of the musk ox parts that he uh, was carved up. This is us pulling into a river um, to pick up fresh water. So this water, there's nothing living up here. So the water is incredibly clean and this becomes the water for the boat. Fishing blocks the ice out of the um, out of the sound for drink ice. So this is how we would get our drink ice. A quick video. So this is Catherine trying to lasso this thing. It's it's pretty funny, the whole experience. And she starts to get it up, and it cuts loose on her and uh, multiple times. By the way, but we did finally fish it out. Oh, that was a bad moment for her. Um, but it, uh, there's the drink ice. So the drink, we did eventually win. So there's a question in the chat about how does musk ox compare to beef. And so it's really interesting. Jeff didn't like it at all, but, you know, he's kind of funny that way. Um, it, it wasn't bad. So it doesn't really taste bad. But I will say that the, the thing that was most notable is if you think about when you go get a steak, right? Um, you It's aged. And, and depending on where you're getting it, it could be aged for days, weeks, months, whatever. It's aged. And so the meat has started to break down so that for our experience of eating that steak, it might be like butter, right? And very chewable. Whereas the musk ox being freshly killed, it never, the meat didn't have a time to relax. So even though chef prepared it, like we had it as a, like in a bolognese with pasta, and we also had it as steak, it, it didn't taste bad, but it was like chewing leather. And at one point we were like, okay, let's go back to the regular menu, which was still, uh, you know, it was all normal food, but fishes and pork and other things. Um, and chicken and just other meals all together because the musk the musk ox as interesting as it was and it was a really awesome experience just wasn't pleasant to chew on right and that to me was the biggest takeaway is like i think if you went out and killed a cow and tried to eat it you'd have the same experience even if you were used to eating beef so i would say if you had an opportunity to try it go for it uh because you know if you got it someplace else you like in a restaurant it would be it would be aged um, the one thing I will say, I have had a uh, cormorant and given the opportunity to eat cormorant again, I never would. And I, that might've actually been a similar issue. It was killed that day, but that meat is like blood red and uh, it just wasn't a pleasant texture. So don't eat cormorant, but the muskox was good. It just, it just was too tough. Um, anyway, just some beautiful like scapes and skies. A lot of that is what you're going to see. Um, moving around through these things. Another ginormous, you know, this isn't a this isn't a building. This is a entire city, right, on the water. And then these are some pictures of Inner Tournament. So really cute little village, right? Uh, sort of this interesting foresight to paint the buildings. Um, so it looks super cute. I don't think that's why they do it, but maybe that's exactly why they do it. There's a cemetery up here in this kind of open patch at the top of the, the low hill here on the left. Um, but again, now there's only 345 people living in this little town and they've got like one market and one store. So they, they definitely appreciate the tourism that comes through there, but, um, they don't get a lot of it. It would be my guess. And uh, this is the sister ship. So like ours, if you look at this one, also two-masted schooner, diesel engine. Um, but you can see that this one has like a cabin on the top. And that is inside is where they did all their 
uh, they could hang out and process and still see the view, whereas ours didn't have that facility, but we were able to see both sides of the boat at any given second because we had a very small uh, little kind of top notch there, but everything else was open to us on our decks where their deck was actually much smaller and much more congested. Yeah, Cormorant was gamey. <laughs> Maybe bring fan with you. Maybe, if I knew that was gonna happen. So we did go under sail on our boat and uh, we had opportunity to get out and Zodiac around it while it was uh, while the Opal was under sail. So we were able to get some beautiful pictures of the sails out. That was last photo and that's pretty much it. So. Um, I hope you enjoyed your tour of 66 North. Um, Roadrunner does lots of stuff. Next year, we are spending our time in Africa, uh, so kind of a little bit different journey uh, next year. We do have some spots still available for anybody who's interested in seeing, like, big, amazing game. Um, we had a couple spots left in Zamanga. Uh, the second Zamanga is sold out. And then we have two Chobi trips, although this Chobi trip, um, it's close to selling out. It's very cool because you'll have four nights on a houseboat in the Chobe National Park, which is a really interesting experience. Um, and then three nights at the Cho in our lodge uh, just outside of the park. And this particular Chobe trip is a uh, lodge only. So, um, but you go into the Chobe National Park and the Chobe, that trip is a river and game drive. And then the Zamanga trips are hides and game drives. So very similar yet completely different, um, all very epic. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And oh, what I, like I said, if you go out to roadrunnerphotographytours.com, there's a page that there's on the left navigation, you're gonna see a, a tab for learning and then you'll see a tab for how to and under the how to books, there's a bunch of free eBooks out there. Um, like I said, long exposure and, um, Aurora are some of them. Yes, Lynn, thank you for reminding me. So, um, you know, I'll have to be honest, it depends on the tour. So like the the Iceland, Greenland, um, and Alaska, I would say we would really emphasize, um, I'm a big telephoto person, right? I like options. So I, I don't carry a lot of primes. I will occasionally carry a wide prime for Aurora, like a 1.8, 20 or a 16 or 24, but it's fast glass and I'm taking it for the sole purpose of taking night photography. Um, so on a, something like an Alaska, for the most part, I would say you get away with 24 to 70 and maybe like a 100 to 400 or a, a 100 to 300 or a 200 to 400. If you have a, like I shoot Sony now, so I would take my 200 to 600, but I wouldn't necessarily have the 600. I might see an animal far away. If I was doing bears, I would tell you to bring a long lens. For stuff like Africa, I would say you want a 70 to 200 and a 200 to 600 or a 100 to 400 or 200 to 500, some version. So it would be very much um, dependent and for all of our tours, we'll tell you what to bring. Um, in Zambanga and Chobe, you do not need tripods or monopods. Um, if you're doing animals like elsewhere, even we used to take our tripods to Katmai, but you can't really have them on the deck anymore. You could bring a monopod to, to Katmai. Um, for all of my landscape photography, particularly night photography, you have to have a sturdy tripod. So we always take tripods to Iceland and um, to up when we go to Bettles for the Auroras. So everything like that though for each trip is unique and it's all on the website, what we would suggest for you to bring. And I have a um, book, is, I have one of the eBooks is about gear. Might be my long exposure talks about like the gear setup for that, but I, Otherwise we would tell you. And there's a whole, usually a whole bunch of information gets sent out to the people participating, but what to expect, how to pack, what to wear, you know, what boots to buy, what plugs to bring, that kind of stuff all goes out to the tour. Um, I've not gone to, Pol to Churchill, Manitoba. It, it, polar bears are on my things to do list. I'm hoping 
Uh, I'm going to go on a tour next year uh, at the Svalbard for, for polar bears. I'm hoping that comes together. I've looked into, I haven't planned, you know, COVID really put a kink in like all of my plans because Africa, this, these trips for Africa um, are reconfigurations of a trip for two years ago. Um, but you can also do polar bears in Alaska on the North Slope up by Barrow. And um, I'd like to build that into um, an Aurora tour. So it's in the back of my mind. But I, I think the only thing about Churchill, Manitoba that doesn't drive me is I think you I believe you stay in the cabs or you stay in the vehicle and then a, even though you might see them in town um it's in town so it, I, I don't I just don't know enough about it I know people are getting amazing shots so I don't want to dismiss it but it isn't my first priority as a shooter to go to Manitoba at least not yet um to see them so I hope that answers the question, Diane. So anybody else? Denise, could you um, stop sharing and then we'd um, be able to right. thank yeah. you. Well, I wanted everybody to yeah. have a chance to see that. Um, oh, my picture. Oh, let me yeah. see. Let me, um, I will show, if you guys want to take one second. Let me move this again. Uh, I just put together a two minute video of, but let me stop it so it doesn't start it. And I'll show it to you. This is, this is what it looked like for us on Monday, the Aurora. So I am gonna share oh. again. Oh, actually, no, I'm sharing. So you're still, you're seeing Facebook, right? Yes, right, yes. Okay. Okay, so this is what it looked like, and um, and we've seen it here before. And what you see in the beginning is pretty typical, but uh, it was is pretty wild. So this is about an hour and forty five minutes compressed into two minutes. Mm. But if you uh, and it would probably look better if you look me up on Facebook, you'll it it doesn't look as kind of glitchy as this thing does. You know, thank Facebook for actually let me do something else. Um, where did I put it? I put it that way. You can actually see it clean. I hate, I hate sharing stuff to people when it looks like crap. <laughs> Come on. Oh, not that one. Bad, bad. This one. Okay. So let me get rid of that. That's like the building it. Oh, go away. I think I know how to use my own computer. Um, all right. Yeah. Yeah, it's going. Okay. Go. The stars look better. Yeah. So you can sort of see that there's some little like bright, almost like brush strokes in it. Um, and you could see them. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you another story after I tell you. So you could see them, but it, you know, it's not really demonstrative. It was just way out in the distance and this night, it was a green glow. And it's funny because people always ask, you know, I tried, I thought I was going to go out and see it and I couldn't see it. Like, why couldn't I see it? Blah, blah, blah. And part of the reason that you can't see it is because, oh my God, I'm playing the wrong one. Gosh, give me a second. I am just an idiot. Okay. It's got to be this one. Sorry, that was the 31 minute. I'm like, why is it taking so long? <laughs> I saw that Dang. and I thought, oh, I like, what is something. that about? <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, here we go. This is now compressed into two minutes. Um, so here's my theory about why people don't see it. And, and, they, and the thing is, as part of it is you see that doesn't look any clear. It will look clearer on your own computer, not all stretched out. Um, you see green here, uh, and you'll see other colors here in a minute, but you have to realize like the camera is collecting light. So every single one of these pictures in this time lapse is four seconds long. So for four seconds, the camera is collecting light and color. Our eyes, our night vision is made up, we have rods and cones, and I believe it's the rods that see color. I mean, excuse me, see black and white. And you need light, you need like a light source 
to activate your color acuity. And so at night, you couldn't tell if I'm wearing black or blue or gray or green or red because there's not generally, if I'm standing next to you, there's not necessarily enough light in that in that sort mm -hmm. of dark night to see the color and that's because you're only activating one half of your visual sensors so people mm. will look up into the sky and they might look out over these mountains and see not knowing what to look for go well i see a gray haze i don't see a gray cloud and um part of me is, i'm just appearing in the photo because there's no light in the room i'm in um Part of it is that you'll start to see this is building, right? You can sort of see that this dome has, it has grown a dome and gotten brighter. There's a brighter rim on this aurora. So out in the distance though, people would be standing on the beach. And if you didn't know, you just think it was cloudy out there and that not have a clue what was about to happen. Uh -huh. And when it starts to get brighter and more active, so now you'll start to see that there's motion coming into this cloud. Um, when it starts to pick up activity and starts to activate those electrons even more, it starts to give off its own light and you can start to see color. And I think what happens, okay, where is it? Didn't do it. Did it do it? Why did it not do that? Oh my God. I don't know. I, I'm like having a moment, a personal moment because it shouldn't be this complicated to get to, I think that I can provide it repost that that was asinine damn sorry i tested it before and it was like perfect um if i go to this one the long one i still pulled that back up let me get rid of that again um so anyway as more light comes into the scene it starts to get brighter and it has more activity and so what i want you to see is you'll start to see this building and then it just oh. goes crazy so this is all the same night. I don't know why I must have done something when I, I got to repost that because this is what I wanted. You know, it ended like right here, but you'll start to see these bands, see the yeah. blue coming in. Yes. And uh, then you start, but this right here, you can't miss it. When it's like this, you can see the color. So I think what happens is, so people will go to Iceland or people will go to Alaska and they will be driving around looking for it. They'll stop, they'll look in the sky and they won't see it. And they don't see it because what they see might be a white cloud or a white contrail and it looks like a contrail and it's not it might be moving but they don't know to look for and then they're like well it's not happening so what i tell people is if you're out thinking you're trying or you're trying to go see it and you think you might see it take a picture don't even worry about your uh -huh. tripod yeah. just hold up your camera and take a 20 second picture and if what comes back on the back of the camera is a color particularly green, which is the most common. And it turns green because those electrons are, are exciting oxygen in our atmosphere. And we have a lot of oxygen, so you get a lot of green. If you start to excite nitrogen uh, at different levels of the atmosphere, that's when you get the blues and the purples and the other color. Um, but if you take a picture and it comes back to you and it is green, then you're seeing the aurora stop and take pictures. And if you get lucky and it really gets super active, then you'll have, you'll, you'll, you'll start to see color in general, but you know, you got to wait it out. So this is, like I said, that was an hour and 40 minutes and I, I must've clipped the back end off, which I have to now go fix, you know, compressed into two minutes. And in that period of time, it finally like lit up. And it, it was funny because it actually lit up. And then if you look at this, it goes soft again. Yes. Uh -huh. Right. And then it lights up again. It, it lit, lit back up. So there's actually this like wave in it. It's completely non predictable. We could have stood there all night and seen just green glow. We could have gotten twice that activity. We could have gotten one minute of activity. It's it's really a remarkable thing to, to witness, but it's also unpredictable, to be honest. Like you have to really go to some effort. So. Denise, how did you take that video? Was it just like a, you didn't have to use a filter or anything? No, it's a time lapse. Uh, so I probably could have actually just taken a video um, with my camera. Oh, that was a time I lapse. Sorry. Two, okay. It was a time lapse. Yeah. And then I, it's taken me forever to get it into a video because, like, you know, it's a, a 
1500 photos or something like that. And then I had to compress all of those to like, cause it was an hour and 45 minutes long, right? Cause that's how long I shot. And then the first time I compressed it, it got it to 30 minutes. And then I did a speed video. And I obviously, when I was editing the speed video, I edited out the cool part. So I got to go do it again. And me a culpa <laughs> on Facebook. I hate that. Um, but um, yeah, the, uh, but that's it. So it's a time lapse. So you could do a video if you have, if your camera does good video and is sensitive enough, you should be able to just take a straight video. And I brought two cameras with me to do that. But when we got there, the activity was so low as you saw in the beginning, that I was like, eh, I don't care. I'll just take the time lapse. And then eventually it took off on me. And I was like, oh, I should have had the video. But at that point, I didn't want to like not get the pictures, right? Because one of those pictures of the time lapse is sitting right behind me. So it wasn't like I had a choice. I, at that point, I was committed to time lapse and too lazy to go get the other camera, really what it came down to. So, um, Next so I guess I'll you see. actually preempted a question I was going to ask because I thought that you could actually see it with your naked eye. But um, so you I can. guess so, my question was so going to be what what kind of um, philosophical thoughts you were thinking when you were seeing these wonderful lights in the uh, in the in the air, but you couldn't see them by your naked eye, right? No, no, no. You you can. So so that's what I was saying. Like when it's when it's there but not super active, it's not it's not particularly exciting. And if you really like look at it, you'll see you'll see motion. Like it'll look like like I said, often it starts as a contrail and then it's like going like this in the sky. Well, clouds don't do that. So like that's your first key. It looks like a cloud, but it's doing something weird, right? Take a picture of it. When it finally like lights the sky up, like some of those pictures you saw in Alaska with all the colors, there is no mistaking that you're looking at an aurora. You see color. You might not see all the blues and reds because again, those are at different areas, levels of the atmosphere. And, and again, you're talking night vision, but the bulk of that aurora that was like big swirly one that I showed at the very beginning that like took up the whole frame, it took up the whole sky. You cannot miss it. And when mm -hmm. it's really, really active, it's crazy to watch. And it is absolutely breathtaking. And that's why often for me, what happens is I set the camera up and it's like a wing and a prayer. And I sit down and I just watch it. So I'm kind of like hoping I'm getting a good shot because I put it on, again, I always put it on a, a inner, like an intervalometer to just keep taking pictures. And the, the prayer in that is it's still in focus. I haven't kicked anything It you know, whatever. I'm still facing the right direction. But part of that is because I really do want to have the experience of watching it and I don't want to have to be behind the camera to shoot it. So I would tell anybody who's shooting this to bring a sturdy tripod and have a remote intervalometer if you don't have one in your camera, lock it up, let face it in the direction that you want it to, you know, get your camera set, like get your focus, get your composition and then let the camera do its thing and don't like have to actuate the shutter every time because there isn't, then you get to actually sit back and appreciate the moment. And when you get the coronal ones, which I will never get here in um, Montana, I'm going to have to go north. We were going to go to um, the Northwest Territories in Canada for Thanksgiving, and they still are not allowing leisure travel. So I'm hope I've moved my date off to March just to go up for the weekend to see what I get. But you have to get up and underneath the auroral band to, um, to really get that coronal activity. But when that comes out of the sky at you, you you will catch your breath. Cause it's like, oh my God, because like it's literally coming down at you and you think you're gonna get hit by it. Now you're not, it's, you know, a hundred miles above you your head, but it has that effect of coming right in at you. And you're like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? It's very different than watching it at a distance and seeing activity. It's breathtaking both ways, but yeah, it's philosophical. Like you, you will sit there and ponder the heavens and you will really have an appreciation for the stories that come out of those communicate the communities, right? Like this is a, it's foreboding or it's an, an omen of this, or it is a, you know, a bringer of that. It's a good thing. It's, you know, it's red. Supposedly they have really deep red ones that happen really rarely. And those would signal things to those communities. Um, and uh, you could imagine how it felt to be somebody in that 
place when the sky lit up on top of you and you had at that point, right? No idea why, just did it. So it had to be the gods, you know, that kind of thing. And you could definitely see that. You can understand why they'd be so overwhelmed by the experience. And yes, about the North um, West Territories, there's a huge COVID out. Well, it's it's still a COVID outbreak, hugest relative. They only have like 5% of the population that have COVID. So it's actually a small percentage of a small population. They don't want it to get worse. And the re they were gonna open up uh, this fall, but they didn't because of the Delta variant. So their hope is late, uh, late fall into winter. So that there's no way to plan around it. Like we tried to get a dispensation for it, couldn't. And um, so I just pushed it off to March because generally March is a good month for it. So we're gonna go to Banff instead because Canada is open. So our hope is we'll see it in Banff while we're up there. Thanksgiving. Any, anybody else for a question? Oh, and there is a question in the chat about, did I hear them? I did not hear yeah. them right here, um, but I have heard them. It's, I don't know if it's like, I would have said a whistle or a singing, but like you hear it when it's super active and you're under it, right? It, because it's wind, it's, it's really interesting. But um, so I feel like I've, I've heard something different than a silent night sky but uh, not, not here, we're too far away. We're very far away from this. This is well like over Canada and we're seeing it. So. Yeah. That's phenomenal, thank you. All right. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you're welcome. Not only uh, was I'm sorry this... I kept you so long. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> for you guys, I apologize. <laughs> I think we, well, we're all here because we enjoyed it, but it was not only just stunning visually, but your storytelling is just captivating. I really enjoyed that. And I find it very generous that you hung around and um, answered all our questions. So thank you. <laughs> well, my pleasure. Yeah, you know, I, I love doing this stuff. I'm um, Our approach, uh, Jeff and I, our, our approach is collegiate. You know, there's, it doesn't do me any good to have these skills if I don't share them with others or go out and see these beautiful things if I don't share them with other people. So I, we're very much collegiate. We enjoy doing the club stuff and, you know, happy to come back, happy to judge if you guys do competitions, you know, just touch base. But yeah, this is, this is the fun part, you know, being able to talk shop with people. So. Well, it's, it's inspiring. I'm, you know, anxious to start traveling, getting out of here. Yeah, you're no, probably thinking, out, does it work in black here. and white, right? You're thinking, yeah. Sammy. <laughs> no, <it's people. laughs> um, yeah. So yes, anyway, black and white. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, I saw quite a few black and whites. I love. Um, <laughs> all right, everybody, we're going to end it. It's late, and we've got a big trip coming up. Yep. We got to pack. Oh yeah. man. Yeah, I'm so awesome. jealous. Oh, Take a photo crazy. for me. Yeah. Text or post or something. Keep me, keep, keep me in it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll think of you. We'll think of all of you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. You were Great. amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. I'm going to be ending it. Yes. Have a good trip. Oh, thank you, Ola. I'll okay. go. Bye. <laughs> Bye.